Fantastic. Hello, Paula. Thank you very much for your for your introduction. So, and good morning, everyone. Um, so, and thanks, of course, to the, all of the organizers for invite, inviting me at this uh, online event. I'm trying to get rid of. Uh, uh, okay. So, uh, in my talk, uh, uh, I will try try to uh, clarify uh, to what extent we can use molecular simulation and relatively simple models to understand the behavior of polymer nanocomposites at very small scale. And also, we will try to understand whether these behavior at small scales can be somehow linked to the behavior of polymer nanocomposites at large scale, so to the macroscopic response of polymer nanocomposites. Um, Polymer nanocomposites are uh, hybrid materials consisting of a polymer incorporating nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles can be spherical or can be anisotropic. And when we incorporate nanoparticles in the polymer matrix, we create a, a contact area, an interface between uh, the polymer chains and nanoparticles. And this interface is very important because it is the location where the interactions between polymer and nanoparticle established. And these interactions are crucial to determine the final macroscopic behavior of, uh, of the material. So the, the, the aim is to maximize this contact area by of course, maximizing the surface to volume ratio of the nanoparticle, which goes with the inverse of the characteristic length of nanoparticles. Polymer nanocomposites, you might already know it, it's, uh, uh, find the application in a wide range of market segments uh, whose annual growth rate is expected to, 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 to achieve uh, uh, roughly $27 billion by the end of 2028. So it's a, it's a market in, in expansion. Why are these materials so important? Well, because by, by adding just a, a few percent in weight of nanoparticles, we are able to improve, potentially improve a very wide range of properties, including mechanical resistance, thermal or chemical resistance. We can improve barrier properties against the gas permeation and so uh, provide additional protection against corrosion. However, achieving this property is not really trivial because nanoparticles tend to phase separate in the, poly in the polymer matrix. And why? Because by doing so, the, the, the chain, the polymer chains would have additional free volume. So their entropy would increase, which means that the free energy of the system would decrease and make definitely this configuration more thermodynamically favorable. Uh, so of course, uh, this is not a situation that we would like to see. Uh, why? Well, because the interface of contact between polymer chains and nanoparticles where interaction are established, it would be very low. And also because uh, this spot here might be a potential uh, source of uh, a mechanical stress for the final material. So what can we do? One option is to modify the surface of nanoparticles so that their interactions with polymer chains will be made stronger and the distribution, the distribution in the matrix uh, might be more homogeneous. But we can also work with other factors we can, or elements. We can uh, work with the, 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 the size of nanoparticles, their size distribution. We can work with the chain conformation. What, ha what would happen if chains were stiffer rather than flexible? But what would happen if we modified the architecture of the polymer so that we can create a nice background ordering where specifically designed nanoparticle with specific interaction might locate and might perhaps orient if they are anisotropic. So these are the questions that I will try to address during, during the talk. And uh, uh, let's see if we, we, can, we can find uh, a, a nice, nice answers. So the first, the first case, of, uh, uh, case study is about the dispersion of polydispersed, size dispersed uh, nanoparticles in a melt of flexible chains. The model that we are using, as I already anticipated at the beginning, is uh, uh, relatively simple. It's a coarse grain model where chains are uh, depicted as a sequence, linear sequence of beads, and each bead uh, 
is, uh, uh, say, representing a number of uh, methyl groups, between three and four methyl groups. Uh, nanoparticles have an inner hard spherical core surrounded by a soft corona whose thickness is uh, equal to half of the, bead, uh, the chain bead diameter. We have uh, uh, nanoparticles in this system of, of different size. Uh, they are spherical, but they have different size. And the size distribution is driven by, is set uh, by a log normal distribution. This log normal distribution has been modified to avoid the presence of unrealistically small nanoparticles. So nanoparticle whose size is, uh, is smaller than the chain bead diameter. So we cut this area off and redistributed across all the log normal distribution profile. The force field is basically taken from the Kramer and Grass model for pristine polymers. We kept the essence, the, essence, the essence of that model, but we had to modify it a bit because the Kramer and Grass model was uh, generated for uh, pure polymers. And of course we have nanoparticles here, but we are keeping the most important element. So uh, the, uh, the, the interactions between pairs of polymer beads are described by purely repulsive potential by WCA potential in red here. And also a WCA potential is used to describe the mutual interactions between nanoparticles. However, we are introducing an element of attractions between nanoparticles and polymer chains using a Lennard-Jones potential that is attractive in some range of distances. The bonded interactions are described by a combination of the finger potential that you see here, plus the Leonard-Jones potential. This sum um, give rise to this black line here, black curve, which has a minimum of roughly one time sigma, sigma m. So basically this combination prevents polymer chains from crossing each other. The simulations, we are using two steps. The first step is using Monte Carlo simulation to create an original suitable uh, uh, configuration that we then use in molecular dynamics to further equilibrate the system. We first thermalize and then equilibrate it further. And finally, we use uh, molecular dynamic simulation in the canonical ensemble to produce how our time trajectories. Uh, when time comes to study the, um, uh, the tra transport properties, the shear viscosity, then we use the reversible non-equilibrium uh, molecular dynamics technique that is based on the muller platte algorithm. I just want to stress that regardless the size dispersity and the average diameter of nanoparticles, we always have the same volume fraction in the system, which is 5%. So we first look at the uh, space distribution of nanoparticles in the polymer matrix. We have here four different frames where we report the radial distribution function of different sets of systems. The difference between A, B, C, and D frames uh, are in the average diameter of the nanoparticles from six times sigma up down to two times sigma. And within each frame, we see different curves that refer to different polydispersity index. So what we, can, uh, what we can see here is that the peak of the distribution is at roughly 2.2 sigma. So we conclude that there is enough space for a, a polymer chains to intercalate between particles, which is exactly what we, we would like to see. We don't want to see clustering of nanoparticles. However, if you look at the fra frame C and D, you will see that there is a no zero probability of observing shorter interparticle distances. And so that means that in these regions here, my polymer chains might not be able to intercalate between particles and clustering can be actually observed. Uh, this is especially um, detected when we go to this sort of unrealistically small nanoparticles. The dashed line refers to nanoparticles of size one. So as big or as small, if you want, as the uh, polymer chain bead. So in this extreme case, we have a uh, significant clustering. What happens to the mobility of nanoparticles in the matrix? To, to answer this question, we look at the diffusion coefficient of nanoparticle as a function of the average diameter of nanoparticles, here normalized with the radius of duration of the polymer chain, 
And we also look at the effect of site dispersity. Simulations are symbols, while the dashed lines that you see here and there are the theoretical predictions based on the application of the Stokes-Einstein equation that you might not recognize because we modified it to include the effect of size dispersity through the use of the log normal uh, distribution. So the, what we can say is, first of all, that the diffusion coefficient decreases with increasing the size of nanoparticles, which is an expected result. We know that the larger the particle is, the slower it will move in a, in a medium. That was known. What was less clear was the effect of size dispersity. What we see is that by increasing size dispersity from zero to up to 20%, the, the, the mobility of nanoparticles increase. And this is also predicted by theory. Now, the quantitative agreement with theory is not excellent, but we need to remember that the Stokes-Einstein equation is not taking into account the characteristic length of the medium. He assumed the medium to be continuous, while we know that we have a polymer here with the specific characteristic length. So when we choose a different theoretical model that does incorporate the effect of radius or gyration, then the agreement, uh, the quantitative agreement with theory increases. So as you can see, as you can see in here and in here. So, what happens when we look at the mobility of chain bits? And this is quite interesting because what we see is that when we plot the diffusion coefficient of chain bits, here normalized by the same diffusion coefficient in a pure polymer melt, versus the interparticle distance, so the distance between the surface of nanoparticle, we see that all the diffusion coefficient of all systems we studied at different average nanoparticle diameter and different polar dispersity collapse all on the same master curve. So there is a sort of universal behavior. This is quite also interesting because uh, it is in very good qualitative agreement with experimental observation uh, in the group of uh, Russell Composto in the States. They studied uh, polystyrene uh, incorporating a silica nanoparticle of different sizes and different size dispersity. So you see here that they plot the same diffusion coefficient versus the interparticle distance, which, is, uh, uh, which has been theoretically predicted as the, to be a function of the volume fraction of the system, which is the same, as I said at the beginning, for all our system, size dispersity, and uh, uh, average size of the nanoparticles. So this is interesting because if we plot the diffusion coefficient of our polymer chain bits versus the size of the nanoparticle diameter, we might not see this universal behavior that we see if we choose the right uh, parameter to, to, to analyze the results. Now, the question is, do we see such a universal behavior only at this particle scale? Or do we see also something similar when we look at the macroscopic behavior of polymer? So to answer that question, we wanted to calculate one in, in very important first property, the shear viscosity. To calculate the shear viscosity, then we look, we extrapolated the value of the shear viscosity for all system studies as, as short, as small shear rates, and obtained the zero shear viscosity. We plot the zero shear viscosity here as a function of the specific interface area that is defined here, which is basically the area, the contact area. Uh, that the in between the nanoparticles and the polymer chains. So again, you see here that this, this surface area is this interface area depends on the volume fraction constant in all our system, but also on the average uh, diameter and size dispersity of nanoparticles. So what do we see? We see that when we increase the size of nanoparticles from one down up to 10, and we cross a number of polydispersity and different average diameter, this curve converged to what theoretically is predicted to be the viscosity of micron-sized fillers. So fillers that are, of course, larger than our nanoparticles and whose viscosity is predicted to be a function of the volume fraction only. So there is a quite nice agreement between this limiting theoretical prediction and our our simulation itself.
So this is the, the, say, the first case study where we manipulated the, the size and the size dispersity of nanoparticles. But what if we change perspective and uh, we want to understand how the conformation of polymer chains affect structural, dynamical, and possible properties of a polymer nanocomposite? So what we did was to increase the stiffness of chain up to, uh, up to observing a transition from an isotropic phase where chains are completely randomly uh, oriented and a non-enematic liquid crystal phase where chains are oriented along a common direction that we call nematic director. Uh, the colors here of the chains is just different to show you that how chains are oriented, but there is no and uh, there is no difference between them of any sort. The model that we are using is exactly uh, the same as the one I introduced before. The only difference is that we are now uh, keeping constant the the nanoparticle diameter, so we have a monodispersed system. Uh, the size of this nanoparticle, the diameter of this nanoparticle is three times the chain width, sigma. And we are also adding an additional uh, element in the force field uh, given by this bending potential that measure the degree of stiffness of chains through this constant kappa theta. We also have four different sets of interactions. So system A, is the one where the interactions between nanoparticles and polymer chains are purely repulsive, while system B, C, and D, the interactions are uh, gradually uh, more attractive from one times epsilon, the unit energy of the system, up to 10 times. So the first impact of this uh, stiffness can be observed in the conformation of polymer chains and that can be quantified by computing the radius of gyration and the end-to-end -end distance. Uh, you see here that by gradually increasing the chain stiffness, we see an increase of the radius of gyration and end-to-end -end distance up to a plateau that is more or less achieved at value of kappa theta that are at least equal to 10. So what happened between, uh, say, kappa theta lower than 10 and larger than 10? Well, the order of chains increases. We measure this order by computing the nematic order parameter that is obtained by diagonalization of this tensor here. Mm -hmm. And where R1 are basically the unit vector that identify the, uh, the, 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 the direction of chains. Basically they are defined uh, joining the extreme, the endings of the chains. Of course, in an isotropic phase, where chains are completely flexible, uh, this, uh, the, the, this, these vectors, the pitch of this vector is meaningless, but then it acquires a very important relevant, uh, um, uh, um, they, they, they become important when we go to an amatic liquid crystal phase. So the nematic order parameter increases from basically zero in the isotropic phase up to 0 0.9 in the liquid, in the nematic liquid crystal phase. So how this affects the mobility of chains? Uh, so you see here that if we plot the diffusion coefficient as a function of the chain stiffness, we see that for the purely repulsive system and the other attractive system, the, the mobility of part nanoparticles decreases with chain stiffness increasing. This effect is less evident when the interactions between the two species are particularly strong. And this is somehow expected because in this case, the the interaction is so strong that the movement of nanoparticles is really hampered. Now, because we have an nematic phase, it makes sense to ask ourselves, uh, does the anisotropic in structure affect also the dynamics? Do we see an anisotropy also in the dynamics of nanoparticles, in the mobility of nanoparticles? So we, what we did was to compute the diffusion coefficient in the direction of the nematic director in the direction of the alignment of chains and also in planes perpendicular to this nematic director. We did this for this first system and as a function of chain stiffness. Of course, the two diffusion coefficients are the same in when we have an isotropic phase, but they then become different, uh, in some cases quite different, when a nematic phase is observed with the diffusion coefficient in the parallel direction 
uh, more uh, larger than the diffusion coefficient in the perpendicular direction. We believe that the, the, the polymer chains are creating, the alignment of polymer chain is creating a sort of a preferential path for the particles to move through. Now, is this anisotropy also affecting the response at larger scales of the, of the material? Well, the answer is yes, as we can see when we uh, compute the zero shear viscosity. You can easily imagine that we have, when we have an isotropic phase, it doesn't really make any difference the direction we choose to apply a shear. A shear. But that difference is crucial when we have an amatic phase. So in this case, the resistance of the system to flow becomes very large when we apply a shear in the direction perpendicular to the pneumatic director, and the zero shear viscosity increases with increasing chain stiffness. The other two possible directions that we have represented here do not show any significant difference between them, and also not a relevant difference with what we observe in the isotropic phase. So the last piece of talk is about how the so if we saw how the effect, what's the effect of changing the geometry of nanoparticles, we saw the effect of changing the conformation of polymer chains. What if now we look at the architecture of the polymer and what if we now choose uh, nanoparticles that can be oriented in, 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 this, uh, in, the, in the polymer matrix? So to answer this question, we, cho we chose a uh, block of polymers. Uh, so these are polymers that are formed by, in this case, by two blocks. One is called H and the other is T for head and tail, but they're basically equivalent and that these uh, is, are completely symmetric. The advantage of using this block of polymer is that they can form very ordered mesophases, lamellar structure, or if you want, smetic liquid crystal phases. Uh, you see some, uh, some chains here, just to, 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 to show you how they uh, uh, accommodate in, the, in, the, in, this, in these layers. Now, when we in incorporate poly uh, nanoparticles of different kind, we see that they can position themselves in some specific uh, uh, regions, domains of the, of the polymer mesophase or the lamellar phase. Neutral nanoparticles prefer to uh, locate at the interface between the two blocks, the two polymer blocks. And the same thing happens when we have strongly, uh, particles that strongly interact with one of either copolymer block or when we have Janus nanodimers. They all position at the interface between the blocks. The only sort of nanoparticles that locate within the block are those that all interact with very strongly with one of the two uh, copolymer blocks, and they are within a given layer. So depending on what our interest is, we can tune this interaction different. We can design different nanoparticles to have them in precise location. Now, if we increase concentration, the attendance are basically the same. They are still where we would like them to be. The, up to 10% in weight, they are able to keep the same mesophase ordering. So the, the lamellar order is not uh, uh, disrupt, disrupted. There can be some frustration in the, in, the, in the way we see these lamellar phases, but the order is maintained. The system just become more crowded. What's the effect on the conformation of chains and the distribution of nanoparticles. This is, these are the density profiles of chains. We distinguish the profiles of uh, the orange line are referring to the H bits, to the H blocks. The light blue uh, curves refer to the density profile of T blocks. And the solid lines is the sum of the, of the two of them. So you see that the polymer is very homogeneously distributed throughout the system. Uh, with some decrease in density at the interface between uh, the two blocks where the center of mass, the center of mass of chains are located. And what about the nanoparticles? So as I said that in, this, uh, in, in the previous snapshot, but this is of course uh, more reliable in terms of statistics, the, uh, nanopar the neutral, non neutral nanoparticles are located at the interface between uh, the blocks, the HH, uh, nanodimers are located uh, in, within the orange, so the H block uh, profile, and the Janus nanodimers located the interface. So we can control their location. Now the question is, since these are anisotropic, it might make sense to align them. Can we control their orientation? 
So we calculated the polar angle distribution and the azimuthal angle distribution of all these sets of nanoparticles. The former is the angle between this axis, the nanodimer axis, and its projection on the lamella plane. And the azimuthal angle is the angle between this projection and any reference axis we might want to define in the lamella plane. You see that the azimuthal angle is basically flat, so all the distribution is, uh, uh, all, all angles are equally uh, probable. But if we look at the polar angle distribution, we see that the one at the neutral nanodimers is picked at zero degrees. This means that the nanoparticles are lying flat on at the, at the, at the interface between the lamella planes. The HH nano nanodimers have a quite broad uh, distribution and uh, the difference line refers to different concentrations. Uh, that means that they are within the H block and there is not a preferential orientation. So they are randomly oriented. Now, if we look at the Janus nanodimers, H0 and especially HT, we see that the development of two peaks at approximately 70 to 80 degrees. What does that mean? It means that this vector here is almost perpendicular at the interface uh, to the lamella plane. So we are able to locate nanoparticle of a given sort into a precise position, and we can also orient them. And the orientation turns out to be quite high. So the alignment of these vectors of the nanodime is quite high when we have uh, Janus nanodimers of this sort with an nematic order parameter that is uh, significantly large. So the conclusion is that uh, they, they form a sort of nematic liquid crystal within a background ordering that has a smetic signature, which is quite nice. So uh, conclusions. Uh, we saw that site dispersity is actually a very interesting parameter affecting the mobility of nanoparticles in a, in a, in a polymer matrix. And uh, it is a fundamental element to uncover the existence of universal behavior. Uh, we saw that at, low, at, at small scales in the dynamics of nanoparticles, we saw that in shear viscosity. Uh, when we increase the chain stiffness, we see an isotropic to nematic transition that affect the conformation of chains that affect the, the mobility of nanoparticles and chains, but that also has an effect on the shear viscosity of the system. And finally, if we want to have a, a say, a, a stronger control on where locating nanoparticles in a given polymer matrix, we then need to think what is the most suitable polymer architecture is and how we want to design nanoparticles. Because if two elements are properly uh, selected, we are able to locate nanoparticles in specific domains and orient them according to what our preferences might be. So with that, I would like to, um, to thank very much the students who have made all this work. Uh, Javier Burgos, who is now at the University of Liverpool, and Oscar Alvarez, who is now at the University of Oviedo. Javier was my first PhD student a few years ago. Oscar was a master's student at the University of Manchester. And of course, I'd like to thank the sponsors and I would like also to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alessandro, for the very interesting talk. There is thank just you. time for a very quick question. Uh, so there is a question in the chat. Um, can you generate the initial configuration randomly instead than using Monte Carlo? Uh, so we are using Monte Carlo actually because we want to generate a random configuration. And I think this is, the, this is what we like to have to avoid any possible correlation at any possible short or long distance between the, the species. So we can do that with molecular dynamics. Yes, we can. Uh, it just takes longer. Uh, Monte Carlo is very useful because you can make a lot of um, physical moves that speed up equilibration. So we just chose, we thought that that might, might be a good choice. Thank you. So because we are just reached the, our time, I want to thank Alessandra again for a very interesting talk. And thank also you, Professor Angeli as well.
so we have 